So after that really long one I just did with um, all the Netflix documentaries I had watched, probably the longest one or second longest one um, entry that I've done so far for uh, all the entries I've done, you know, it's still shocking for me to like see that I'm up to over 200 entries now. So, uh, you know, I was just, you know, watching a whole bunch of stuff I have on my list, things that all premiered at the end of the year, things that I've been, you know, sitting on for a while. And I kind of like came across this one, which isn't from this year. It's actually, uh, at this point, five years old. It came out in 2018. And what was interesting about it was it kind of just flew right under my radar because it didn't seem like something I would necessarily care about to begin with. It's a Netflix original film that, um, I don't know. If it, I don't even know 100% how to explain it fully. So it's called Outlaw King. It came out in 2018. It's got Chris Pine. It's got Florence Pugh. It's got Aaron Taylor Johnson. It's this story that's sort of the sequel to Braveheart, which is interesting because we know that Braveheart, for anybody who is a fan of Braveheart, if you don't know what Braveheart is, Braveheart is a 1998 Mel Gibson film, I believe, or 1997, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe even earlier than that, maybe 1995 or 1996. It's late 90s, and it's the story of William Wallace. And what William Wallace basically represented was the uprising of Scotland against the British Empire to come over and take their land from them. So it's all about this, you know, kind of European sort of civil war but also sort of just, you know, uprising for the people to for, for freedom, you know, freedom's purposes. And Braveheart is a film that went, you know, to theaters. It's, I believe it's based on a novel. Off the top of my head, I can't remember exactly. But now you have this movie, which Braveheart ends on, you know, William Wallace being captured. And then they, they murder and slaughter him. And they, like, sort of put him on display. And this leads other, you know, Scotland royalty that's still around to kind of be like, okay, now we should take William Wallace seriously because what he did actually mattered. It's it's a very interesting kind of like, why didn't they do something like this beforehand? And even how William Wallace is caught, it's, you know, very, you know, backstabbing uh, because, you know, we're talking about the 1300s and nobody really cared you know, who they backstabbed to get their way or to get their freedom and things like that. So they threw William Wallace to the wolves. He gets captured. But the movie ends with a, a shot of this huge battle of whoever's left that's in Scotland that's going up against England, you know, to fight for their freedom. And in that movie is a representation of Robert the Bruce, who also becomes, you know, royalty of... Uh, some land in Scotland. I forget exactly what it was. That that portrayal is um, played by Angus McFadden. And I know him from th things like 45 and Warriors of Virtue. He's been around for a while, and he plays Robert the Bruce in this film, who's sort of like a, a side character. He's not really main. He's a side character to the entirety of the story. So in this film, it takes up right after that story. It picks up with Robert the Bruce, who's played by Chris Pine, and, you know, England's kind of like, you know, thank you for kneeling, and we're going to give you back your land, and we're going to make you royalty again. So here's Robert the Bruce, he gets his land back, he becomes uh, Lord Robert the Bruce, um, I, I forget what the actual, like, Scottish title of him is, but Robert the Bruce is given his title back, he's given his land back. And then shortly after is the, the, the capture and the, the slaughter of William Wallace. And then that's where, you know, Chris, uh, Chris Pine, uh, Robert the Bruce, he's like, okay, now we have to do something. So it picks up from there, and then it tells the story of Robert the Bruce and what, you know, his rebellion sort of did and how they sort of managed when it came to dealing with um, uh, Edward I of England uh, and his son, the Prince of Wales. So, with, with with them kind of roaming around and kind of trying to get people to back them up, they're getting slaughtered every every which way forth, and they just can't seem to catch a break. And 
uh, Robert the Bruce is also married to uh, Florence Pugh's character, who who she plays the daughter of somebody who's of English descent. And then she starts believing in him and starts seeing like, oh yeah, we we have to raise Scotland up, we have to free the Scotlands, and we have to go against England. So it's very much an interesting take on that on what happened after Braveheart. And it's also very interesting to see that it took 20 years to even get this. Maybe it's because nobody realized that, like, maybe a sequel to Braveheart would work. And nobody even mentions that this is a sequel to Braveheart. It's literally just called... It's a different name. You wouldn't even notice it was based on what happened after the storyline of Braveheart or after that point in history, what Braveheart represents, that this was a sequel that followed in line with that. You wouldn't even know it if you didn't realize that they talk about William Wallace, you know, for maybe a total of, like, ten minutes scattered throughout a two-hour film. And just with that little bit of knowledge to know that this is just what sort of led, what was sort of leading out from the ending of that film. Even though the ending of that film was not exactly what happened, you know that these are the events that did happen after those events, the events of the entire film. And what's really cool is just how they sort of kind of learn how to deal with the fact that they're like, you know, 150 men fighting, you know, the thousands upon thousands of men that uh, um, England is coming over with. And there's this really great battle, like, right at the end of the film, where all their, it's like literally 100 of them, and then there's 500 English soldiers, and all the English soldiers are on horses, and the Scots know this. So what do the Scots do? They use the terrain to their advantage, so they, like, get the water nice and muddy, and they isolate themselves on this little island that's surrounded by all these traps, and they dig trenches, and the trenches have spears sticking out of them, and they just, like, start slaughtering everything, and their main thing is just, like, you kill the horse. When you kill the horse, the man will fall off. Hopefully, when the when the horse fucking reels up, and he'll fall on top of the man, and then two birds, one stone. Always aim for the horse, because you're gonna hit the horse before you hit the man. Kind of fucked up if you're a horse lover, but essentially, you know, we're talking about war. It's you or the guy on the horse or the horse, I guess. You know what I mean? It's just weird that this kind of, I mean, it flew under my radar. You know, I don't go around looking for Chris Pine movies. You know, I'm not the hugest fan of his. I don't really have a problem with him, but I don't go out of my way to watch his stuff. I didn't even recognize Aaron Taylor Johnson until like midway through the movie. And I'm like, you know, that he looks familiar and he doesn't sound like he's just, he's covered in hair. He's got like hair down to his shoulders and he's got this huge beard. You really can't recognize him. What really made me watch it was Florence Pugh because I'm on this Florence Pugh kick because I think she's like blowing up. I love everything that she's doing and I I just love going back and seeing what she's done prior to this. And one thing I'm learning about just her sort of, um, I guess, tenure in, you know, film, it's really a lot of these, you know, aged pieces. She, She was in Lady Macbeth which is also a piece that takes place in, like, you know, the 1300s, 1500s, something like that. She's, you know, you have Outlaw King. She just um, also did, um, what was she in that was also, like, this sort of, well, no, it wasn't um, the Midsommar thing. She did something where it was about women. I think it was based on a book, too. It might have been called Little Women. I feel like it was called Little Women. And then she she had at least two other movies. I can't think of them off the top of my head now. But she had at least two other women where they like she just plays these characters that are part of these time pieces, uh, the, these timed out pieces that take place like you know hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And I think she does those roles you know really well. You know there was a movie that came out not too long ago. I think it was Netflix or maybe it was a a show on Netflix. Where she plays a nun, and she plays a nun. I can't remember the name of this one either, but I know it's on my Netflix watch, you know, soon list. Uh, And it's about, like, her being a nun, and there's, like, this woman who hasn't eaten for, like, 40 days, and she doesn't look like she has any sort of malnutritious effects. So Florence Pugh plays a nurse, 
and then there's a nun, and the two of them are trying to figure out if it's, you know, if there's something scientifically wrong with her, or if there's something, you know, spiritually wrong with her, and it's this, like, battle between the two. I can't remember what the name of that film is, but that's on Netflix, too. It's on my list. And so I put Outlaw King on my list, and I was just like, I gotta watch this at some point, because I... I'm as obsessed with Florence Pugh as I think everybody else has been for the last three years. Ever ever since Midsommar in 2019, I've loved her and I love watching the stuff that she's, you know, been in and been doing. So I like want to see more of her. I also have Don't Worry Darling on my list, but that's got a huge bunch of controversy behind it. And I don't know when I'm going to get to that, but eventually I'm going to get to that. Um, so I digressed a little bit into Florence Pugh stuff, but Outlaw King is really fun, especially, you know, considering that if you don't realize what it's about and you go into it blind and you discover what it's about, it actually, it excited me a little bit more. It got me feeling a little bit more like, oh shit, that's pretty cool. And it made me really more enticed to see the rest of the movie and see what they went with. I definitely think it was a bit more... I guess gruesome, but then again, you know, we're talking 2018 gruesome is different than 1995 gruesome or whatever, whatever year Braveheart came out off the, um, off the top of my head. I can't remember, but you know, those levels of gruesome are different. I do remember in Braveheart, there's that big scene where, um, William Wallace gets his, his revenge on the, the, the man who killed his wife and he puts him up against the pole and he slices his throat. That's pretty graphic. But nothing is as graphic as what a lot of the a, a lot of things they did in this film. It's really enjoyable, and if you loved Braveheart, you should definitely try try out Outlaw King if you didn't even realize it. And if I'm the first person to tell you that it's essentially a sequel to Braveheart, you know I'm sorry I spoiled it, but it's still worth it. It's still totally worth it. 